Uh, yeah, Joe Daisy. Oh, Joe. Okay. What yeah. What is that scene behind you, Joe? That's most impressive. Latuya. Ah, uh, where is that? Uh, it's between uh, Southeast Alaska and Prince William Sound. Okay. Wow. I see Cape just a little bit. Impressive. A little yeah. glacier in the foreground there. Yeah. Yeah. Looks okay. like the Eyes Inlet about 10,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we want to uh, do we want to get going here? Oh, ready. I, I need to mention um, later on during the meeting, we're going to talk about uh, the Port Townsend event that will be June 6th. And we, we have a few different options for location. So we'll, we'll discuss that later. It can help if people mute themselves during the presentation. Yes. Uh, Good point. Uh, okay, John, I think we're ready for you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to hit the uh, share screen here and hope that it all works. Okay. Let's see. Oh, dear. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I said share screen. Let me see if this works. Can you see that? Not, not no. yet. You'll, you'll need to select uh, uh, which, which thing you want to share with us. Oh my God, what am I doing here? Uh huh. Okay, open Zoom US. Okay, I'm back. Now I need to share screen. Photos and no. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Am I she? Am I sharing a screen here? Yes, you are. Yep, I can oh, see. Okay. It. Do you see the whole thing? I see uh, Discover Project, and hold on, I got to move this little guy. Earth, and I see the back of uh, uh, which appears to be a book. Yeah, this uh -huh. is um, okay. As long as you can see this, sure can. Um, I'm starting chronologically with with these four programs that I'm going to talk about tonight. These four projects, and this one started in about 2007. I got a phone call one day from an administrator working for Impossible Pictures in London, England, and they were doing this uh, pro program for the Discovery Channel called, at that time, it was called 10 Ways to Save the Planet, but they only ended up with eight ways. So they called it Project Earth. And um, the project that I was um, involved in was on disc two, episode four. It's in the center of the, uh, of, or the upper end of the, of the middle column there, Brighter World. And it was a, the scheme was, to pr produce a, a fleet of drone trimarans 150 feet long that would sail around the ocean and make clouds by spewing submicron size water droplets out the top. And, this, and these trimarans would be powered by Fletna rotors and they, those are these big uh, cylindrical things and they spin up and uh, they act like a sail, they drive the thing forward. Um, the brainchild of this was this guy here, um, Dr. Stephen Salter. He and a, and, a, and a climatologist named John Latham came up with this idea, which is pretty harebrained. And, um, and so this, this project had actually two phases. One was to produce the droplets, which they were never able to do other than pyrotechnically. And the other one was to produce a, a, a prototype vessel which you can see here in the background, um, which is a Seabrenner 34 that we fitted with Fletna rotors. So I'm, I'm going to lead you through this project. It's pretty interesting. I'd never done anything like this before. I mean, I'm talking with this guy on the phone, and he's telling me that he wants to borrow a trimaran on which they want to fit these Fletna rotors for a demonstration. And I said, well, you know, Nobody's going to let you borrow a boat and then modify it <laughs> to the extent 
that you want. So, and, and the, you know, the, the, the whole resale market was very, very slow at the time. And I said, hey, it's really pretty cheap to go out and buy one. So we looked around and uh, we, we found one and uh, fitted them with these flat rotors. And this is what we came up with. Um, this is uh, the boat ready to go, except that uh, the movie company didn't like the full candy stripe. So they made me paint most of it out. They, they left the middle one and the end ones and the rest of them they wanted me to paint out, which was a shame because it's the only way you can really tell that the, that the, the rotors are spinning when they're spinning because they're, they're so well balanced and they're so true that, that uh, if they were just painted white, you wouldn't be able to tell whether they were standing still or not. So in the beginning, I, I decided I really needed to get smart about Flettner rotors and figure out how these things worked. So I had an old model of a Sea Runner 40 passenger catamaran laying around that I had fitted with radio gear. And I had a two channel radio and um, so I, I uh, made a Fletner rotor and uh, put it inside this thing. It, um, it has a, a motor inside that spins it up. And uh, here we go. We're in a few knots worth of breeze here. And here's the rotor going. You can see the very top of the thing sort of a blurred. Um, and uh, it, that's all it's driving this boat is this Fletner rotor. Um, the, the effect is called a Magnus effect. It's what makes a curveball actually curve. Uh, because the uh, rotor is spinning in a free airstream, uh, when air is passing by it, obviously one side of the rotor is going against the air passing by it, and one side is going with the air going by it. It creates a differential pressure between one side and the other, which is basically lift, and it works just like a sail. Now, the little black vein on the back of the thing is a revelation to me. I only had Two, um, uh, two channels on this radio, one which would give me the speed of the rotor and the other one was steering. And when you tack with this boat, you have to stop the rotor and turn it in the other direction. And that's what that vane does. It actually is flipping a toggle switch that's mounted on top of the cabin there. It flips it from one side to the other and, and makes the rotor spin in the other direction. <laughs> so that was my first, my first, you know, understanding of what was really needed in a, in a rotor boat. So we bought this Sea Runner 34. It was stashed in a boat yard in the middle of Florida um, in, in a basically a swamp and it was rotting away there. It was built in Canada and the guy had just basically abandoned it. So uh, we bought it for not very much money. Um, the movie company bought it, that is. And we, we took it to a, a boatyard in Fort Pierce where we were gonna be based for this project and uh, set to uh, fixing it up. Well, it was a drought year and we were gonna float the boat through the cross uh, Florida canal through Lake Okeechobee and so forth, but there wasn't enough water, it was too shallow. So we sawed the boat into three pieces and trucked it over on a flatbed truck. And here we have the three pieces um, and I think there's another photo here. Oh, this is a great photo, isn't it? Aren't we having fun here? We're, we're bolting and gluing the boat back together again once we've done some, some of the fix up here. That's me in the background and, and uh, a boat builder friend of mine named Tim Zeal in the foreground. And Tim and I were a real team. We're, we're the guys that built the rotors. And this is the way we started. We, uh, we uh, rented a shop across town in Fort Pierce and um, set up to build these rotors. And Tim built these uh, molds. Um, the, uh, the, this is a pure radius a cylinder mold here, um, a female cylinder, which we lined with thin uh, aluminum, 040 aluminum. And uh, we cut the radius with a, with a router um, pivoting on an arm. So it was, it was absolutely perfect. And then we cut each of the cutouts for aluminum square tubing stringers to go into it that were absolutely perfectly flush. And then we pushed the, the, um, the aluminum down into the mold and the, uh, all of the joints for each aluminum panel were right on top of the, uh, uh, the, the, the mold formers. 
And then, um, then we covered the joints with uh, actual duct tape, you know, that, that self-adhesive aluminum foil stuff and use this um, to build um, rotor panels, um, quarter section uh, longitudinal pieces of curved rotor. And this is uh, two layers of uh, six amp carbon cloth, top and bottom over uh, half inch divinacell foam. Uh, vacuum bag um, against this uh, uh, aluminum mold. And the aluminum was, was very, very accurate. Um, and we, we actually uh, molded a joggle uh, along one edge of each panel such that when we glued the edges together, um, they all were perfectly flush on the outside. So we really got into business of manufacturing these panels. Um, you can see a, a one here that's been sanded in the way of every bulkhead that's going to go into it. Um, you can see on the, on the right hand side there, this one that's uh, showing the finish on its exterior surface, which is perfectly smooth. And then uh, below that, you can see the masts, which were pieces of eight inch aluminum pipe, 20 feet long. They weighed 200 pounds a piece. And uh, we stuck those in the boat. Um, beefing up the cabin top where we, where we drill a hole through to, to receive them and, and uh, beefing up the floor where the foot of the, of the mass base was going to be surrounding it with a, with a lot of reinforcement and so forth. And then um, we, we had to build these fences, uh, which are those uh, washer shape, shaped discs that are on the outside of the, of the uh, rotor. And you can see a table there that we built using um, metal studs to make it absolutely perfectly flat so that it had no wobble or anything. And that was built uh, just, um, just doing a wet layup on the table uh, with carbon and, uh, and the same foam. And here we are, we've got two panels. We've taken the aluminum out of the mold. We're just using the stringers now. And we're gluing two panels together but using aircraft clecos um, to, uh, to, to glue it together along one of the stringers. We use Proset um, epoxy to, to glue the pieces together. And then after that, we added um, a, a bunch of bulkheads. The ring bulkheads are quarter inch plywood to keep them as light as possible. That bulkhead, that's a full bulkhead there is one that's mid height and it's got a giant um, uh, self-aligning ball bearing in it that carries the entire weight of the, of the, uh, the rotor. And then uh, once they were done, um, gee, they were light. You could pick up one end, um, the, that, that rotor, um, 31 feet long, four and a half feet in diameter, uh, weighed less than 200 pounds. Uh, it was amazing how light it was. And uh, we put it on a spit um, and rotated it around. We, uh, we, we fitted it with these fences. We went into manufacturing on these fences. Uh, and, and build a bunch of those, um, cut the hole uh, for, the, for the rotor on the inside, uh, uh, four and a half feet in diameter, perfectly with a router on a, on a table, swinging around and cut the outside edge, swinging around with the same router and um, put the whole thing on a spit like this and rotated it. And when we did, we found out that the runout on the surface of the rotor four and a half feet in diameter and 31 feet long was less than an eighth of an inch. We, we were that close to being a, a absolutely perfect cylinder. And uh, when we stood them up and rotated them on the boat uh, and they were bright white, you couldn't tell whether they were moving or whether they were just standing still. And here you can see the bottom rotor there isn't painted yet. We just painted them with house paint, latex house paint. We didn't even finish off the edges of the, of the fences there. Each one of those washers, uh, it's just uh, raw foam with, uh, with, with uh, carbon on either side. And here it's fully, fully painted um, in, a, in, a, uh, in its cradle. Uh, we're rolling it out of the shop on a bunch of pipes and uh, the flatbed truck is coming over to pick it up to take it to the boat yard. And Tim and I did all of this in the span of about four months, uh, built two of these, one 31 feet long, one 27 feet long. 
Um, and the uh, meanwhile, we had uh, I had another four guys working on the boat, getting it into the shape, putting the mast in, and all of the reinforcement that was required and everything. Because what had happened in the very beginning of the program, I hired a boat builder to do all of this for me. And I was going to be the engineer that stood by and watched it all happen and did all the design work. Right. And on the first day of the program, he had uh, open heart surgery. <laughs> and so uh, I lived 200 miles away. So I stepped in and commuted down there uh, weekly for about seven months, seven to eight months, I think, um, to run this project. So, so here we are. Uh, rotors are all done and uh, we've got one on the boat and uh, we're picking up another one. We even had to make a little fixture there to stop from crushing the bottom disc as we rotated this thing up off of the ground, off of its cradle. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of parts to this thing. And uh, this was the day, this was early in the morning. Uh, we picked a, a day that was absolutely windless because we had to, we, we couldn't stand to have these things swinging around. They had to go down absolutely vertically. And you can see on the top of the mast, there is a little teeny pin sticking up. That's got a, it's a three quarter inch diameter pin with a conical head on it. And that pin has got to hit that bearing 20 feet up inside that thing dead center. So that, so that it, it rests on the bearing and rotates properly. Uh, the drive system was uh, fairly simple. Uh, we devised this um, clamp on uh, bracket with motor. a um, golf cart motor um, and a cog belt drive. The, uh, the speed of the rotor uh, maximum was about just over 300 RPM. Um, and uh, we're driving it from a bunch of uh, go kart batteries. I mean, uh, uh, golf cart batteries uh, down below, which were, were, would last a few hours, which is going to be long enough for the demonstration. And here I am in a man lift. This is one of my favorite toys, boy. I, I could get up 35 feet in the air and drive around the boat yard with this thing, and it was the most fun. But uh, on this particular day, I, I was painting um, the, the candy stripe on. And the wind was blown, and I had white caps in in the in the roller pan. Um, in fact, it was splashing onto the deck of the boat. We had to go paint it out later on. But um, the rotors had spin up um, perfectly. We we uh, spent some time balancing them by spinning them up and watching them wobble. And I just put a pencil down on one of the fences to get the the, the pattern of the wobble. And I just added some bolts along the edge of the um, of the uh, uh, one of those uh, upper uh, fences to uh, to make you know basically counterweights until until we fooled around enough and got it right so they did spin up without any wobble at all. So here's launch day. We're launching. Um, the boat's name is Claudia. Um, that was uh, Stephen's choice of name, and we had to put up these um, these these little. Um, uh, I guess pr protective grates you can see that are protecting the um, the cockpit because uh, when you spin the rotors up, um, they're eight feet in diameter, those fences. And um, th they're going over a hundred miles an hour at a couple of hundred RPM. Um, and it, it looks a lot like a saw blade. In fact, um, you, you know, you, you can envision the worst case analysis that the thing, um, comes unglued in the middle of the whole thing and falls down into the cockpit and just chops us all to bits, you know? So they, they, the insurance company wanted us to put these things up and it didn't do much good. Um, wouldn't have done much good, but here we are. We had one day to demonstrate this boat um, to show that it, it would perform. Uh, we finally had six knots worth of water, uh, uh, six knots worth of wind and we're making six knots through the water on a broad reach. Not too bad. Um, we have the outboard motor. We're, we're actually dragging the outboard motor. It's not running at this point. Uh, you can see Steven in the cockpit. I'm leaning over in the back there in, the, in a light t-shirt and the guy in black is a guy that you'll recognize if he turned around. His name is Kevin O'Leary of the infamous Shark Tank. He was one of the producers of this thing. Um, 
he uh, he made it very very, uh, very easy to dislike him. In fact, I came close to throwing him off the boat at one point. Thought that would be a bad career move. But this was our crowning glory um, day. Um, the boat worked flawlessly. Um, Stephen tried desperately to give the boat away to another academic institution that could run more tests and and play with it and get some data out of it. Couldn't find anybody. Finally, um, it had to be disassembled and the uh, and the uh, the rotors went to a landfill and the boat went back into sailing condition. So that's the end of that project. The next project happened in, I think, 2010. Um, I was reading Wooden Boat magazine one day and here's this challenge from the from Wooden Boat and Professional Boat Builder Magazine saying, hey, uh, we're looking for a design and it must be fast and seaworthy and simple, it must be Spartan over commutations for two, it must be trailerable, yeah. maximum weight of 3,500 pounds, the most must, must have positive flotation, watertight storage, and finally the boat must have good seeping attributes with the ability to stale to windwards in a gale. I thought, hey, they even picture a trimaran there. I think that's one of Kirk Hughes's. Um, and I thought, geez, you know, that's pretty easy to do. So I, I started doodling and came up with a boat I called the DC-3, the G Design Challenge 3, or, you know, giving at least some credit to the old DC-3 airplane, which is after 50 more years is, is still flying around in most of the world, just, uh, you know, one of the planes that's iconic and going to be around for a long time. No printer's planes. Yeah, right. And um, here's here's the interior. It's got a place to sit down below and some bursts up forward and a, and a aft cabin that has got a head in it and, and can make a berth up and it's got a lot of options. It's outboard powered, it's, uh, and it's got our latest in swing wing technology. And I uh, wrote up this um, this thing, and and sent it in along with a model that I made of it, demonstrating, you know, what how the boat was built. The forward cabin top is uh, is a is a constant camber panel, as are all of the hull panels. The aft cabin top is also a constant camber panel. The thing is very simple, basic to build. It's got this new swing wing technology that we were advocating for uh, smaller boats. Um, and uh, and it, 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 it folds up to eight and a half feet wide very easily. You just push it in and it just swings in. Whoa, a little green there, but yeah, you get the idea. And by golly, um, I won the competition. Um, there were 50 entries from 14 countries that they were choosing through. And uh, I only knew John Wilson at, uh, at, at um, Wooden Boat Magazine. I didn't know any of the other people. I didn't know uh, Matt Murphy, who is the editor who wrote this article. I didn't know Robin, my current wife, at the time uh, she was working there. Um, and uh, I had taught there a couple of times in the eighties, um, taught boat building school. Um, but um, anyway, um, this, is, this is what happened. And uh, since that time we sold a bunch of plans and uh, one of them um, is being built in Southern California by a good friend of mine named, uh, uh, um, Chuck Finolio, he's been around forever. He's 85 years old and he built this one. It's ready to launch. These, these photographs are fairly recent here. It's a nice looking boat. Um, he's doing a beautiful job with it. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, exquisite. Um, this was taken with his iPhone, so it's a little jagged. Um, shows it folded up, um, but um, just really, really nicely done. I like the color too. A um, lot of Akumi plywood. This is looking down below forward. So there's a big, there's a double berth up in the very forward end. And then there's a place to sit here um, 
right in the foreground and, and uh, a, a, a tilt up countertop here. And this is actually um, the, the, the multiple use space. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the galley, it's the workshop, it's the everything. Um, and this is the same place looking aft into the cockpit. So you, you step down onto the counter and then uh, onto the seat in order to come down below. It's got storage areas underneath the, underneath the uh, cockpit floor for uh, fuel and, and water and whatever. Then this is the aft cabin. There's a, you can put a porta potty in that, in that below that hatch there. And the, and the aft cabin is big enough for, um, for, for another person berth. So it'll, it'll actually sleep about three. But it's a fairly compact boat and, and it's a very, very strong boat. So it, it'd be good, you know, expedition cruiser. You could uh, tow it behind the car until you're almost ready to go where you want to go and plunk it in the water and away you go. And there's Chuck at 85 years old, just uh, trying out his nets that he just put on. And uh, we should see the launch sometime this year. The next boat started long time ago. My, uh, this is a, 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 a client that came back to me um, from um, what, 2001. He, uh, he built a 54 footer of mine and wanted a, a boat that was larger because it wasn't big enough. And he said he had a 26 foot uh, tender that he wanted to put on the new boat. And I know he's a pilot because I've flown with him. And um, I said, well, you probably want a helicopter too. And said, yeah, yeah, we'll probably do a helicopter. And I said, Dan, you want a smart car? Yeah, I want a smart car and all this stuff. So we started to add up all the toys he wanted to take along with him. And uh, he said, well, he thinks something around 90 feet will do. And uh, so this next drawing is what I drew at 90 feet. And this is what I got back from him, see? This is, this is the way it goes. You, uh, you, th you throw something on the wall and if it sticks, then maybe you fly with it. At this point, um, we weren't getting, you know, the aesthetics that we wanted. Uh, we really didn't have near enough room to put on the kind of stuff that he wanted to put on. So the next stop is we went to a hundred feet. Uh, we started to look better at a hundred feet. You know, at, um, at 100 feet, we got some fairly nice accommodations down below. We got uh, three guest cabins in a forward end of the main cabin there. And we got a nice big salon with a dining table around it and a big galley. And he wanted a dive locker back there and, and room to put the, the Calcutta um, walk around 26 footer catamaran back there. So we, we started to slowly, you know, work toward, you know, what was gonna, what was gonna fit for his, for his needs, push and shove things around. Well, ended up, we finally ended up at 110 feet um, for the hulls. Uh, it's actually about 111 and a half feet long. Um, end to end, if you uh, take the curvature of the, of the bow deck there. And I always extend the deck all the way out into the bows. If you've ever seen power catamarans that have their decks cut away in between the bows, you know that they're going to see a lot of spray against the, the, um, the, the bridge windows um, in, in any kind of snotty weather. In fact, um, even with the deck all the way up there, there's, there's going to be a lot of spray coming up in certain conditions. And you just try to keep everything dry on the boat. So you know, any serious power catamaran is decked all the way to the very bows. So we started to really work on the aesthetics of the boat. Here's the last drawing at 100 feet. And um, like I say, we got to 110 feet. And this is the boat under construction. This, this picture was taken last year. Um, it's a three year construction project. Um, being built in the old gunboat factory down in Wanchise, um, North Carolina. Um, he's actually rented um, only half of the 300 foot long building there. The, build, the His shop is a, 
I think it's 100 feet wide and 150 feet long. So this, this boat fills pretty much all of it, you can see here. And uh, I'll tell you, designing something like this is, is really daunting because the structure um, is very, very important and very difficult. So the first thing I did is go out and hire a card carrying naval architect specialist in structures. And here he is standing here. And this gives you an idea of the scale of this boat now. But then again, Jeff Van Gorkum here is only about five foot five tall. So <laughs> but his, the top of his head is right about where the waterline is. And you'll notice that the knuckle in the bow there is above waterline. And that's because this boat is designed to go into ice. When, uh, when we were discussing the design of the boat and I asked the owner what he'd ever considered going around the Northwest Passage, all of a sudden he, he fixated on that idea. <laughs> so that's where this boat is headed. And um, we, we beefed up the, um, the planking, um, all the plating in the four, four peak area there is, uh, is all heavier than the rest of the boat. Um, the uh, framing intervals are doubled up and uh, the stringers are heavier um, just to meet oncoming ice. He's, it's not an ice breaker, but even going through slush ice where there's plates of ice floating in the water that are gonna bump against the boat is, uh, it can cause a lot of damage. And so you can, you can see the gargantuan size of this thing. Um, it's um, the, the stairs there are, you know, eight inches a step. So you can get an idea of how high that is off the ground. It draws, it will draw about four and a half feet of water when it's, when it's launched. Um, we have three foot diameter propellers and two MTU 1600 horsepower 10 cylinder diesels driving this boat. It's got 12,000 gallons of fuel aboard. So we can do our range is about 4,000 miles at 15 knots. The uh, length to beam ratio on this boat is around 13, uh, which, which really gives it some nice performance figures. Uh, most of our um, uh, most of our catamarans for passenger carrying and so forth are, are length to beam ratio of around 10. This is a lot more slender to give us some, some real speed performance um, for, for making distance. And um, he specified a five foot draft. So we, we're having to limit it to, trying to limit it to five feet. It'll be about four and a half light and just over five feet when it's fully loaded. The uh, all up weight of the boat um, in the end is gonna be around 320,000 pounds. The weight of aluminum in this boat is around 150,000 pounds. That's the amount of aluminum that's in it. <laughs> it's just crazy. You can see the side of the boat where it's in primer now. Um, just to give you an example, that exhaust pipe there, 14 inches in diameter. You can practically crawl into it. And the, um, the interior is under construction now. Um, he added another crane on the foredeck, which I'm, I'm sorry to see. Um, because he wants to take his 17 foot um, twin V outboard powered catamaran with him. So we're gonna put it on the foredeck, I guess. Um, this boat has um, two 250 gallon, uh, um, 250 kg uh, Rockna anchors that go in those little slots there. And um, the, Total weight of chain on the board on board is about 3,500 pounds. Uh, five eighths chain, high strength, and this meets uh, the American Bureau of Shipping um, standards for um, 
for super high strength um, holding power anchors and high strength chain. We're meeting ABS standards throughout the whole thing, even though we don't have to. The owner's going to self insure. He's not going to, you know, there's no financing involved, but just as a as a as a check, uh, meeting the ABS standards for uh, for aluminum vessels is a is a good qualification to make sure that we're on the right track. Here's the interior. We're standing here in the main salon, looking forward into the accommodation areas, and that one portion there that's floored on the left is two staterooms. The uh, the interior of the boat is entirely suspended from the main structure on top of a self-adhesive tape called silimer. And it's a shock absorbing foam tape. And there are no through fasteners between the interior surfaces that you will see when you walk into the boat, into the boat structure itself. Uh, uh, aluminum boats typically are real rattle factories. Um, it's a very high modulus material, so it transmits a lot of noise and vibration. And the only way to get rid of it is to go to extreme measures to isolate all of the boat structure from the interior. Even that plywood floor there is three quarters of an inch thick. The middle layer in that plywood is rubber. It's a special type of acoustic um, rubber um, plywood designed to not transmit noise through it. And then we've, of course, we've, we've uh, foamed the entire in inside of the, of the uh, skin structure on the outside, you can see there. And then, um, and then paneling is being um, stuck on top of that um, and adhesively fastened with that silimer tape to all of the studs and verticals in the boat. And here's the beginning of the woodwork going to the boat, a lot of um, paneling going in fancy woodwork paneling. Um, yeah, the, the boat's gonna be a real show boat in the end. Here's, here's one of the bathrooms with a shower uh, pan installed already. And that's a, that's a door to the outside, uh, you can see there. And so you, you, that's part of the walk around deck beyond it. So this is what it looks like uh, in a rendering. It's gonna have a fly bridge. The, um, the actual uh, second deck is being built separately off the boat and won't be stuck on the boat until they get it out of the shop because there isn't vertical room in the shop to put it on but they will be able to get the, uh, the, the, the lower deck on uh, with a Portuguese bridge around it and everything. He's showing a Jet Ranger here. We have an updated um, one coming up. Uh, he's actually showing a, 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 a monohull uh, tender right there. Um, that's actually a catamaran and uh, showing a smart car. And he's since added a two-man submarine to the uh, list of toys. There we go. There's the R44 Robinson uh, helicopter. That's the real helicopter that goes on board. The, um, the skiff is not going to be there in front of the helicopter. That's already been moved to the foredeck. And the, uh, the Carib um, uh, uh, catamaran tender um, is, is showing there now. That's the actual one that's going to be, get used. Lots of solar panels um, and a big, huge aquarium window there on one side. The, um, the, in the main salon there, the, the wall, outboard wall uh, on this side is, is going to be um, entirely glass. Um, and that glass is over an inch thick um, to, to meet uh, strength requirements for the boat because it's got to take you know broadside waves and so forth. And then um, finally, um, my boat, Syzygy. Um, is this is a boat that I'm not selling plans for, so don't ask me. 
Uh, syzygy is a, a technical word meaning three celestial bodies in alignment, namely the earth, moon, and the sun. On, on any eclipse, uh, solar eclipse, um, that's, in, that's when the planets are in syzygy. And it started with one drawing and a model, of course. And I found out some interesting things. I would want to use the flat wing, swing wing technology that, that Jim Brown came up with that we've used in a number of other boats. I also wanted to make the Akas arched to, to make them nicer looking. I wanted the boat to really look nice. So everything is rounded, molded, as much as I could. It's, it's a plywood and strip plank boat. It's, it's all wood, but it, it, um, people are fooled. They, they think that it's a fiberglass boat when they look at it. And it, and it folds up um, very smartly. And, and I'll show you the folding system as, as it was developed, which was the, the main focus of, of the construction here. Um, I wanted to build something for myself that was uh, academically interesting to do. And so I, I made the folding system rather complicated. Um, but we'll see in a minute. This is one of the Amahals built on a flat table. It was built one side at a time, um, split along its vertical center line. Here it is rolled over. And, and the deck rolls up. And then uh, I left uh, an eight inch wide um, slot along the top there that gets filled in with plywood so that I could reach down into the boat and, and, um, and attach the keel seam together on the inside. And uh, these half formers were, were um, you know, screwed, screwed down to the flat table. I used them twice to build the port size of, of both hulls and then turned them around and, and screwed them down the other way so I could build starboard sides to the hull using the exact same formers. And, they, and, and I was shooting staples into them and it was quarter inch plywood there. They were pretty well shot by the time I got to the fourth hull. The main hull was built standing up on, this, on the same table. Um, some plywood, some strip plank, um, a narrow hull shape, uh, 14 to one, uh, slenderness ratio, um, lots of complication with uh, two layers of six ounce cloth on the outside of all of that strip plank on the inside also. Turned it over, turned it inside, you know, on its side here so I could do the, the fiberglass lamination on the inside. Um, all, all of the intermediate frames came out and just left the bulkheads and there, you can see four bulkheads right there, two up forward and then, um, and then the, 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 the darker ones in the midsection. Um, I, I, I was given some Brunzeal plywood. So those are, those are some 30 year old Brunzeal plywood pieces that I, that I got. And then of course, uh, like any boat, it just gets put upright and then you start adding stuff into it like a centerboard trunk and you know, it goes on and on. But it started to get interesting right here. Um, I didn't want the Akas to go all the way through the boat because um, it, it would get into the, into the uh, cockpit area and um, it would stop you from, from having any access into the forward part of the boat except through the foredeck hatch. So I, um, I, I stopped the Akas right at the hull side, bottomed them, bottomed them against the hull side. And then Robin came up with this brilliant idea of why, why making that, that bulkhead the aft bulkhead flat, it should be curved because everything else is curved. So I pulled a slight curve in it and all of a sudden the, the bulkhead walks over on top of the Akka there and supports the Akka. And that was the, that was the, the primary support for, the, for that Akka. So uh, and the, those are um, two layers of uh, fur lumber with, uh, with quarter inch plywood top and bottom solid, absolutely solid. They take a lot of bending stress. And because I wanted arch in this, in the, uh, in the Akas, um, I decided I'd start off with a, 
a dihedral angle of eight degrees. So I, I bought myself a smart level and set the boat up very carefully in the shop, um, making it level and, and flat and everything else. And then uh, glued these all, all in very, very carefully with using a smart level. And you can see here that actually those Akas have to have washout in them. That is that they tilt down forward. And that's because if you arch the Akas and then swing them in, they, they, uh, the keel lines end up dragging on the ground and it's not gonna fit on the trailer. So all of a sudden you have to, you have to twist those, those Akas a little bit to, uh, to keep the, the, the Ama up high enough so it'll be above the wheels on the trailer. And it was a real trick. So um, you'll be able to see more of it later on. It, it proceeds like normal stuff does. And it, this was fun because I was sort of making it up in the shop as I went along. I didn't have plans for this. The only plans I had were some, um, uh, I drew out all the sections for the, for the frames um, and uh, I had a line drawing and that was it. And here are the Akas going together. And um, I, I did them because they required uh, some fairly heavy clamping pressures. They were made out of uh, two layers of three ply, three eighths plywood, top and bottom sandwiched over one inch thick balsa core. And the plywood gave me two thirds of its wood going axially along the length of the Aka and one third um, in, the, in the hoop direction, 90 degrees transverse to hold it all together, which was almost perfect. And this was cheap plywood, but boy, it was, it was very strong. It was heavy, but very strong. Each one of these Akas, um, four and a half feet long, weighs about 30 pounds. It's not too bad. And then the ends get beveled off and they get these um, round face plates screwed on to them. And then a bunch of blocking behind that to, to fare that into the rest of the arm. Here's the, um, here's the table that was on the, uh, on the ama to receive the, the end of the akas. Uh, I made a, a plywood uh, tube and then cut slices off of it, wedge shaped slices off of it to get the right angle. You can see there that the, uh, that the, the the Amahal has got one stringer left inside of it. Uh, it's got a plywood flat deck portion, but the rest of it is uh, a very strawberry shape, um, all, all strip planked. A lot of work. Now, now you can see the actual down angle of the Akas that are glued into the main hull there and, and, and how they work with the, uh, uh, with the swing arms. Each one of those um, almas weighs exactly 100 pounds. I can, I can grab it by the in, inside the uh, access port and and lift it up and walk it around walk around with it even now. So it it worked really well. The the, the whole idea came together. The the most difficult portion was the bolts that that. Um, are the pivot bolts in the AMA there. You can see this, uh, that big turntable there, the big round turntable. Those bolts are 11 inches long. And those, those pivot axes, all of them um, on, on each side have to be absolutely parallel with each other or else they'll bind or try to bend the bolts as you swing it in and out. And, you, and you'll notice that you know something is binding and not right. And um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, with fixtures and angles and so forth to get all of those bolts um, just almost perfect. And they, and they came out really well. Each one of those bolt holes is lined with a, with a fiberglass tube bushing on the inside too. There's no raw wood contacting the bolts. So here's the boat ready to go on the trailer, masked, uh, you know, on a, on a crutch. Um, with the, uh, the nets in place, all the nets um, are, uh, are on quick release hooks and so forth. A um, couple of lashings get loosened and you pull them off the hooks and roll them up. And um, 
Let's see, the rudder looks a lot like some of the my three meter rudders. Um, same kick up design with, uh, with a bell crank um, and, a, and a pull down line that goes into the cockpit. <coughs> same type of um, outboard motor mount, just a plank sticking out of the side of the boat that um, uh, with a long shaft motor allowing you to to kick the motor up the motor heads behind the cockpit there so it doesn't get too wet and um and the lower end comes out of the water when the boat is sailing the boat is absolutely clean on the bottom when it's sailing the uh the lines of the uh on the rudder system are all dyneema uh low stretch dyneema here's here's the boat all folded up ready to go you can see the nets um stay in place um uh, uh, on their attachments to the to the main hull side and they got unrolled when the boat is unfolded and and um, hooked up on the outboard side there's a little bit of the detail there uh, of the network oh and those tubes recognize those tubes wayne yes i do <laughs> <laughs> found a use for them and they work yeah. really well <laughs> Yeah, there's the nets all rolled up, ready to go. And this is where we have to go, we live in the, in, the, in the winter time here. All the boats come out of the water in the winter time in Maine because the harbors freeze over. Uh, we've had some years here we could walk from, walk across the harbor on, on the ice. So everything lands inside the lean-to here next to my shop. Uh, the the amas get hoisted up to the ceiling and the boat gets rolled in and all taken apart and that's where it lives all season but in the summer season oh man here we are sailing on the Egamagan reach um that's deer isle in the background and um this is uh only about 20 miles away from where we live i uh, i have a mooring to use at center harbor um and uh, I, I can go down there and in 10 minutes i can be out on this wonderful piece of water with all kinds of wind and the boat goes, um, it goes on up to 10 knots really very, very quickly. Um, I've had it up to 15 a few times and uh, 15 knots, man, it's like going 200 miles an hour down the highway in the family sedan, you know, it's just, it's really a blast. It is so much fun. And the old timers that go for a, uh, for a ride with me on the boat, they sit there and they just say, all I can say is, this boat is so comfortable. It is so comfortable. They're used to sailing these old things with the with the uh, the, the combing, you know, burying into the into their back and, and no comfortable seat on the whole boat. My boat was considered from the very beginning to, to just it, it had to be comfortable. That's uh, that's Jimmy Brown uh, across from me there. Uh, next to him is Robin. And uh, the guy that uh, you can't see there is a, a world-class windsurfer sailor. Um, but uh, this, is our, this is our first day of sailing. We're, we're having a little trouble with the halyards because uh, the, the halyards were Dyneema and they were slipping on the cleat. Uh, we couldn't cleat them off. The, the Dyneema line was so slimy that it wouldn't hold on the cleat. Finally ended up having to go back to the old Hobie system of using a, a um, uh, uh, halyard lock on the mainsail and uh, the jib is now uh, seized onto the to the jib stay with a roller furling so um, the uh, the whole jib and everything just rolls up and it makes it so nice no big head soles, no fancy stuff no gear all over the boat just two strings to pull and away you go so a lot of fun so that's the end of my show folks Abity, abity, abity. That's all there is. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for yeah, watching. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very nice, John. Thanks a lot. Beautiful, John. That was terrific. <laughs> well, I'm not trying Thanks. to sell anything tonight. That's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's uh. How long is the boat, John? Pardon me? 
What's the length of the boat? Oh, um, Syzygy is 21 feet long, uh, 16 wide when it's sailing, and it weighs 850 pounds um, dry without crew aboard, but with motor, anchor, fuel, motor, um, sails, mast, all the rest of it, 850 pounds. And I really wasn't trying to make it that light, you know, but it just didn't accumulate much weight. You know, there's no interior, no, no head, nothing fancy. So it weighs less than a Hobie 16. Um, Hobie 16, my, I thought they weighed around 300 and something when they were without crew. That's when they're new. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. They gain weight after that. <laughs> <laughs> they soak up. Yeah. That, this this um, boat's got a Hobie 16 rig on it, uh, but with a larger, main, uh, larger jib. I moved the hounds up so that the jib is bigger and found out that I had to put um, spreaders on it because the mass was bending pretty wildly. So I got swept back spreaders on it, but um, well, yeah. So Wayne, what's the story with those tubes? Those tubes that I, I bought um, when I was building three meters, I was gonna use them as uh, aukas. All right. They were larger than stock. They were large diameter tubes. I think they're three inch or something or other. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to make a light boat because I was so a twat. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they do a good job of holding those nets up, boy, and they weigh That's nothing. Perfect. They weigh nothing. It's amazing. For those of you that uh, may not know the history, uh, John was the original designer of the three meter design that we built, what, 10 boats in your garage, did a layup on a, on a mold and uh, everybody basically got a kit um, if you were one of the original joiners here. And I still have the original kit, I never built it. It's at, it's at my parents' house in Port Ludlow, which is coming up for sale now. So I've got to get the panels out of there. But uh, what year was that, that those were laid up, Wayne, in like 1988 or something? Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. Now, did you ever get any other three meters uh, sailing up there, John? Yeah, we, we had a bunch in Canada. Um, I'm, I still sell one now and then. Um, I had two here for a while. The white boat um, came here and got... Um, rebuilt with new amas and uh, sailed as uh, sour grapes. That's right. And then the, my boat was bananas. Uh, it was a fruit fleet. <laughs> and um, we had a lot of fun with them, but Robin wanted something that was we could go sailing together. So we, we sold the two boats. We used to stack them one on top of the other on the trailer. Yeah. And, uh, so we sold the two boats and, uh, and built Syzygy. So, uh, but Greg has been sailing around in a Fulmar 19 for years with this uh, fancy windsurfer rig. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Oh man. I have a, uh, a marine railway here on Dyes Inlet. It goes out a hundred feet from the bulkhead. Unfortunately, with an 18 foot tide, uh, tidal range, the tide goes out, out about 400 feet. So I have to launch and recover at a plus six or better, <laughs> otherwise I can't get home, which is a little tricky. So it makes for an overnight there for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. That boat's not a real good overnighter, I must say. No, but no, yeah, that little boat uh, really goes along. And uh, John was right uh, way back when he basically took his name off the design with uh, the way the Akas fold. Um, I, I have not built rigid um, amas, I mean. So, I mean, the, the amas are nice. The akas need to be rigid. There's still too much motion. Yeah. But well, that, that was, boat gets to 15 knots and it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it was supposed to be a car topper when we started out and it, 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 it never quite got there. But a fun boat. I remember sailing a prototype. It was really a blast. Yeah. But you, that, you've got it tricked out. I mean, that you, you're really into performance there, Greg. That's so great. It's so good to see you. And uh, I, I have, I have the picture of you sent me of of the boat um, just streaming along fast. 
in my collection here. It's well, it points high and it, it really runs deep too. In fact, I can even sail by the lee slightly uh, because it's a fully rotating freestanding, you know, sailboard rig. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a full wing uh, camber induced. This, I think that has the five cambers in it. Uh, basically a, a 10 meter sail. So I need about a 12 or something around here most days, but it's a nice combination. Great, great. Hey John, was, was that the boat that you built down uh, on Seaview Avenue that had the pedal power? Yes. Okay. Now I know yeah. what it is. Yeah, it was it was called the Shearwater back then, and finally they uh, called the uh, Fullmore 19, and then it went into production in Canada and got lost after that. The guy that started was named was John Sinclair. He was a he was a a, a, a professional fisherman um, turned lawyer, and he 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 was a little difficult. The it. it it went through a lot of what I call mission creep. That is, we uh, we started on one mission and ended up trying to, you know, change the mission along the way, and it and it didn't bode well. He put in a second cockpit and the aft end of the boat, and it and it didn't work well at all. It's a single cockpit boat. It was it was perfect. Yeah, a lot of fun. Is anybody building a cyclone? Uh, are there any around? Um. I don't think in the Northwest, um, there, there are a few in California. I've, I've sold quite a number of plans and I can't remember, um, they're scattered all over the place. I remember, I remember sailing out with you and, and um, you, I think your wife was along uh, and... Um, Lee Murray? Lee in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, we had a nice sail that day. That was a fun boat. That was really a fun boat. I really loved that boat. And that's yeah. that's what this new boat, Sisigy, is all about, is to get back to that. That's what it looks like. A little shorter. That, you know, 23 feet was a little bit too much um, for me, so I made it lighter and smaller. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a fast boat. That would go over 15 knots easy. Yeah. But it was comfortable. That was yeah. a good deal. It was so comfortable. <laughs> you could sit there in that seat and have all the cocktails you wanted. Yeah. And nobody had to move when you came about. No, just sit there. Yeah. Fun. I'm wondering if we can get an update from Joel and Patty on the Marples 35 that they're finishing. Are they yeah, here? We're pretty close to ready to go cruising. We pulled the boat out and inspected the bottom, moved the water line up a little bit and put it back in the water. And so now Patty actually, he's up in Seattle right now visiting her parents. She's gonna be back on Friday and then we're gonna get ourselves ready to head south. So we're, we're out of excuses to not go south. The boat's, the boat's ready. I think we're as ready as we're gonna get. So yeah. just start looking for a weather window and start moving our way south. How much did you wind up uh, raising the water line on the main hull? I think we raised it um, three inches. We didn't need, well, yeah, we raised it three inches. We really only need to raise it a, a couple inches, but I didn't want it. I didn't want any more slime on our white paint. So it's, it looks a lot happier now. Okay. <clears throat> Speaking of when, slime. When do you think you'll hit San Diego, Joel? Um, it's a good question. I mean, it, next two or three weeks, it depends. Wow. If the weather's nice, we may kind of go down the coast slow, but if the weather doesn't look that great, then we'll just work our way until we at least get around the corner just to get into some better weather and a little bit warmer weather. So it's a, it's a good question. We, you know, if the weather's really nice behaves, we might spend some time in the islands. Otherwise we might just keep working our way south until we get closer to San Diego. I, I ordered a code zero for the boat and I think it's not going to be ready until after we've left. So I think we're going to meet up with one of the offices down in, in San Diego to put it on. So I know we'll be down there in the next, within the next month anyway. Where are you guys at right now? We are uh, in San Francisco Bay actually in, in Richmond right now. Cool. 
we sort of done as much as I think we can do in the bay. And um, so yeah, now it's time to start becoming real cruisers. Okay, well, be careful going down the Sur Coast. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't wanna to wait too long there. It, it blows 35 every day in the middle of the summer. I'd, I'd prefer to avoid that. <laughs> This time of year, you should be getting, um, the wind could probably go from either direction, but once you get into June, it'll be pretty much steady from the Northwest. Yeah. Um, and then it gets to, this gets really a lot harder. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a nice time to go down. I've been watching the weather and it's getting more consistent and you know we can, because we're both fairly rookie sailors, we may just day hop our way down. There's enough places to go. And if, if it gets complicated, we can just do a quick overnighter, but but it looks like we can just work our way down pretty easily. We had just had some friends do it a couple of weeks ago. They sailed from just two boats over from us. They went down to San Diego and had a pretty nice ride. So we're just going to kind of follow in their footsteps. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, I'm down in Southern California right now, spending the days in San Luis Obispo and then Burbank in the afternoons. I was noticed there was a gale out on the uh, just off the coast for most of the week. So. Just curious yeah. where you guys are at. Yeah, we're hiding from that. <laughs> Actually, pretty nice in the bay. We're 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 doing pretty well. I'm just just messing around with stuff now while Patty's up in Seattle, and the boat should be ready in a couple of days. So then we just gotta put a little food on it, and we'll probably go around the corner and hang out in Half Moon Bay, and and then we see some nice weather, work our way down to just start working our way down. It's just. It's not that long of a trip as long as we pick nice weather windows. So, well, you can stop in Monterey, but after Monterey, you're, you've got a long ways to go down to get to Port San Luis. Yeah. And that's the roughest part of the coast right there. Yeah. Well, thankfully the days are getting longer. And so we'll, we'll start early and yeah, figure it out. Is there any advantage of going out a little bit further from the coastline, like getting out about 100, 130 miles off instead of staying within like? within the of the 100 when it comes to the California during the summer. If you want nope. to do it in one shot or go all the way down to the islands or something maybe, but. All right. Nope, there's no advantage at all. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> I didn't well, think. You might be outside the zone of the Santa Ana's, which could be a benefit. Sure, but okay. Just have to watch those inshore sometimes. Mm. Hmm. Hey, question for John. What kind of software are you using right now for um, both your designing and your modeling? Um, paper and pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I can't render that good. You gotta be awesome. awesome. I, you I have never used software. When I, when I need software, like for that 110 foot power catamaran, we hired HydraComp, um, which is a um, an analysis group that specializes in, uh, in in hull form, hull design, and they can give you, you know, all sorts of uh, um, power analysis, resistance, rolling analysis, the whole works, and and recommend propellers and stuff like that. It's it's not worth it to try and keep updated with that sort of stuff um, yourself, um, and because it it's it's too cheap to have it done. I can't even buy the machinery um, to do it um, for the price that they will perform the calculations for you. I mean, not necessarily the calculations, but the rendering software, say like that. 50 oh, that's all done in Rhino. And that was all done by Jeff Van Gorkum. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. What I did was uh, basic design, act as chief engineer. Um, and Jeff did all of the structures um, of the boat. I mean, we're using American Bureau of Shipping aluminum boats um, as the design method uh, or the checking of, of our method um, to, to assure that we're not making any big mistakes. Um, but other than that, it's, uh, it's, it's all um, standard marine architecture stuff um, that, uh, that I can do with a paper and pencil. I can do the calculations with paper and pencil, but when it comes down to actually designing the boat, um, he, he did it all with CAD using Rhino um, and um, 
um, I, I, I don't really know how all that stuff is done. It's magic. I mean, he's, yeah, he's gotten like down to the point where we're putting small details on some of those renderings. It's amazing. It looks like the renderings were done in Keyshot at a Rhino, but I was just curious if you had something else that was fancy pants. I, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I, I just, I'm just in awe of the, of the quality of the, of the product that comes out. Great, yeah. thanks. Hey, John, how did you uh, consider the helicopter deck? In, in rough weather, the deck is pitching all around and the helicopter's trying to put one skid down first and what kind of impact surface did you have to have or is it limited in, in the amount of motion that you can land a helicopter? Yeah, there is a lot of consideration there. Um, the uh, American Bureau of Shipping actually describes what has to happen and the, the, the structure of the deck is actually designed for a low level crash. Mm. And their main concern is that fire does not get through into the living spaces below. Wow. That's their main worry. Um, yeah, that deck is 18 feet above waterline. Um, the boat is 35 feet wide, so it's reasonably stable. It, it could have been wider, except that we, you know, we didn't want to have to go into huge shipyard spaces the 35 feet is pretty much the the maximum that you can uh, get a travel lift to pick you up with so th that that was our basis but the um that that deck was had a lot of design consideration in it yep um the helicopter has to be strapped down and obviously um there are <coughs> operational limits weather wise for for the copter um, not an easy thing to hit um, a, a deck and then expect it to stay there. You know, once once you're down, it it has to be it has to be tied down very quickly if there's any any action at all. I, I this this client is a is a is a pilot. Um, he's a he's a very careful pilot, very prudent pilot, and he would not fly if there was any any um, any any weather problems associated with the operation of that it's just you, you end up being too close to structure i mean the uh, the blades are below the flybridge so you know a mistake can be really catastrophic um he he considered at first he wanted an icon a5 uh amphibian airplane um and uh, because he's he's a fixed wing airplane guy but um Handling an airplane um, and getting it aboard a boat is very, very tricky. The, the airplane is, uh, is very fragile. You've only got to run it into the boat on a corner somewhere and put a ding in the wing and, and um, you're, you're out of action until you can get it fixed. You know, it's one of those things. It's floating around in the water. It's, it doesn't have any power on the water except for the propeller. And you're sort of, you know, you just sort of got to shut it off and coast uh, up, up to the boat, very, very difficult situation. So the helicopter was a much, a much better choice, but, and but still said, tricky. And, and he's, he's learning how to fly one. He's going to have to get pretty good before he can land it on that deck. Wow. <laughs> Robinson has a high mast at least and gets the rotor up a little higher. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing an R44. Yeah, R44 is what we're looking at now. It's a 1,500 pound um, uh, machine. No, wait a minute, 2,500 pound machine, I think. Yeah, yeah, with a with a six cylinder um, Lycoming in it. Yeah, makes a lot of noise. Does he have an icon that he flies not on the boat? Are there many of those? No, he, he's got a uh, Cessna 206 Skywagon right now. It's insanely slow, um, you know, at 135 knots, he's, he's just jumping and, you know, kicking up his heels thinking he's going so fast. <laughs> I had a hard time keeping my plane below that. <laughs> it wouldn't go that slow. <laughs> what, uh, I know you built a couple, what, uh, what? Well, I had an RV6 for a long time. And it would cruise, it would cruise at 200. And which one was that? An RB6, oh, a, yeah. a Van Grunsman. It's one of the most popular kit planes available. Yeah. 
I did a bunch of speed mods to it and, and got it up to cruise at 170 knots. So yeah, it, it, it would really boogie. Well, you might suggest another plane to them from the early 60s, late 50s, a uh, Mach 2 Delta Wing seaplane called, <laughs> called a Sea Dart. Check it out. <laughs> right. Yeah, my, right. dad, my dad did some research at, at Caltech on that one. And yeah. we, we uh, <laughs> my early memories are trucking around a wind tunnel model of that thing. Wow. With many, many moves. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. It never, never took off because it, it, they, you know, they didn't like to mix jets and water, I guess. Seawater. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> It's a rocket, basically, is what it is. That's right. It's a crazy yeah. plane. It's a... Yeah. Yeah. Given a seaplane, I'd probably pick a gooey duck. It's a... <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a, essentially a little bit, it's a, between a goose and a mallard for a Grumman. Oh. Similar, but it's all composite, multi engine flying boat. Uh huh. I'm uh -huh. making kits for them now. They're, if I ever pick one, that's probably what I'd do. Yeah. We used to have a guy in the multi Hawk club who had one of those lake um, lake amphibians that he flew up to Alaska all the time. Yeah. Um, Al Lundell. Yeah, Al Lundell. I remember him. Good yeah. Answer. Yeah. He actually <laughs> flew it into one of the one of the fly-ins we had once up, up there near Bellingham and and landed in salt water and drove it right up on the beach and. I talked to him later on. He said he's never going to do that again. <laughs> the salt water, the yeah, salt water yeah. caused him a lot of grief because it's all aluminum airplane, you know. Yep. Well, yep. Speaking of, of helicopters, all right, what do you guys think about the helicopter that's flying on Mars? Pretty nifty, huh? You guys know about that? I, I, I'm just, I'm just absolutely speechless that they, they could design something not knowing not well knowing very little about the atmosphere that would fly and do it so well right out of the box i mean flawless performance well, they tested it very thoroughly yeah yeah i saw the pictures on uh, on the on the nova thing when they were building it when it was in the lab right and uh, strange looking rotor blades and uh Boy, uh, uh, my hats off to those guys. That, that's uh, that's that's a real some pretty nifty engineering it's an engineering coup. They did it perfectly. Yeah. Well, if you might remember from that documentary, most of the energy required for operating the helicopter is spent just keeping it warm. Huh. They, they they only use like 40% of the battery capacity for flying. Wow. And the other energy is kept just to keep it warm enough to be to work in that really cold climate. Yeah, and then it can't go over and plug into the wall in order to recharge. <laughs> <laughs> I think the flight time was 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I... I'm just blown away with all the fancy engineering. They they did it very well. Boy, those are smart guys. Very smart guys. Yep. Well, I'm um I'm starting to fade here. It's getting it, it's late here. Yeah. It's almost eleven o'clock. I'm way past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying up late with us. Well, Thanks. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I did talk to Jimmy. Um, and um, he, he knows you, Diane. He's talked to you before. And, and he, he, will, he will do something. He just has a real difficulty with his computer is all. Um, he, he, can't, he can't put things on the computer for you to look at because he can only see you know something the size of a half dollar on the computer. And he's got to go get real close to it and search around for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, his mouth works really well, <laughs> so he can talk, and he's got lots to talk about. Yeah, so. yeah, he sure does. It would be great if, if Jim Brown would uh, come and uh, you know hang out with us uh, one of these times. Uh, uh, yeah. Dan Dan Hill uh, there has uh, has one of Jim's boats. 
Yeah. Yeah, Dan, right. you, you want to? Well, John, say hello to Robin for me, and I hope to see you guys next year. Hey, yeah. And let's let's talk on the phone, Wayne. Keep on trying. Okay. I called your phone, and I heard a whole bunch of people's names I didn't recognize. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of people living there. <laughs> no, I left you a message. TV. Okay, I'll keep trying. Okay, man. Yeah, let's chat. That'll be fun. Yep. Oh, John, I don't know if you if you could see all the names of the participants, but Floyd Moore was here for a while. Wow. And, and I see uh, John and Rita Kepner are are still here. So, so uh, yeah. Good. Wow, some of those people. Mm -hmm. We're all getting really old. Yep. <laughs> I'm getting younger. Yeah, I know. It's it's awful. It just happens. Yeah, Rick Sutherland says hi. He's down in Crescent City, California, visiting his sister right now. But ah, still working for Boeing? No, he's retired from Boeing now. Oh, okay. Well, great. All right. Well, good to see some of the old guys still around. Hey, and, and what a good showing you guys have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Well, we, we really appreciate you putting a presentation together for us, and, and it was super interesting to hear, see and hear about four, four of your projects. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Every once in a while, I get something that's so interesting, I just have to say, yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's go <laughs> do that, you know? That's, that's kind of the way those projects were. Couldn't say no. Good night, John. Okay, uh, good night, you guys. So, so John, one thing I wanted to say, I. Uh, Went over and had a look at back an owl this afternoon. Oh, and uh, the guys working on replacing a fair amount of the decks actually, and seemed to be piecing it together. And uh, he wasn't there at the time, but he's he has it tied up to a floating dock. We've got a workshop set up with a generator and a bandsaw and a, all the tools there. And so it looks like a fair amount of the decking's getting replaced, and the bows of the almas are getting rebuilt. And oh, it's all yeah. uh, about the water line of the boat floating at the moment. I don't know if they plan to haul it out and do more underwater later on or not. Well, that boat is 51 years old this year. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I needed my re decks replacing about that age, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> it just... You know, and it was built with plastic resin glue and, and you know, not the kind of stuff we have today. I'm surprised it lasts as long as it did. But, right. geez, only hard work and it'll keep it going. Yeah. That was... Well, thank you for that. I, I, I wish him well. I hope, he, uh, I hope he gets to go sailing and not just work on the boat some. Well, the owner of it actually lives on the, somewhere in the East Coast. And he's been keeping it here. And he's wanted for years to get somebody to sail it down to Mexico and then somebody take it through the canal and back up to Kingston, Ontario, where he lives. But whether that'll actually happen, I don't know. Whoa, that's a long <laughs> way, yeah. Right. Yeah. Huh. Oh, so this next Tuesday, right? A week, a week. Uh... Okay. okay. Well, uh, we'll, we'll have our um, club meeting and social time. Um, uh, next and uh, John, you're you're always welcome to uh, come and see us anytime you want. Yes. All right, I'll stop in once in a while. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the invite. Yeah, good night. Guys. Righto. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>